here today. We are excited about this very unusual Holmes Church event because we're going to be focusing on church starting. Now, here's a trivia question for you. What's the most effective evangelism tool in the history of Christianity? Starting church? Bingo! Get the guy an apple. <laughs> hey, Billy Graham did good. Sunday school does good. Evangelism explosion is good. But really, if you think about it, the best tool for evangelism ever is starting new churches. Because when you start a church, ideally it goes on forever and ever, and you cannot calculate how many souls will be brought into the family of God because of that congregation. So we thank you for being here. I want to introduce Doug Williams. Doug is the leader of our church planning team. So Doug, thank you for helping organize this. And uh, he is joined by Leon Jones. Leon is on our team. And so is John Charpy and Jacob McAnally. And these guys have put together a great program. And so we're going to learn about church planning. And uh, I think you're going to be excited. Thank you, Doug. So, thank you so much for being here. It is good to see my friend Jay Lemons, Faith Baptist <laughs> Jay, would you be kind enough to open this meeting in a word of prayer, please? Sure. Love to. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, thank you so much just for, for your graciousness and your goodness over our life. Lord, thank you that. We are, are now adopted as, as your sons and your daughters, Lord. You have given us the kingdom. And now, Lord, we lift up this time. God, we pray for our, our planters. God, would you uh, just bless them? Lord, would you bless this time? Lord, would you give us a big vision uh, for what you are doing and for what you, can, you desire to continue to do here in the Mid-South? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 So our schedule this morning is we're going to go about an hour. Then we're going to break for lunch. And you can purchase the tickets out at Guest Central. That'll give you a little six dollar lunch ticket, and it should be good. And then we're going to come back to you for the final session um, at twelve o'clock. So, Jacob, would you and your team come up here and let's get this party started? <laughs> All right, guys, glad you're here. That's um, y'all know there's been a lot of stuff going on. I mean, a lot of stuff going on in Mid South. I mean. Tons of stuff. Y'all come on in. People are going to be trickling in, so uh, that is totally normal and fine. But right now, what I'd like to do is call up our victims, I mean, the panel of church planters uh, that I've asked to. These are active church planters, guys that we are actively uh, supporting, that have been planting for a while. And uh, I'm really glad uh, that you guys get to meet some of my friends, some of the people I've met, they're out there on the front lines doing ministry and doing things that uh, maybe you don't know about. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to call up some of these church planners. First, uh, I'm going to call up Brandon Mathis at El Shaddai. All right, now be sure I don't mispronounce anyone's church's name. We have Josh Allen at Transform Church. You guys come up, just find me a seat, guys. All right, and uh, Trey Bouges. At uh, City Church, come on up. We have Luis Coleman and uh, Lucy. If you want to roll up here too, you can. She doesn't want to. <laughs> I knew she was going to say that. But he's at Brown Baptist Brazil. We have David Malara uh, from Iglesia Bautista, Philadelphia. And Roz will come up here and translate for me. So y'all know Rod will. And finally, we're going to call up. None other than Doug Williams from Risen Savior Ministries. Yeah! Oh, look. So I do have some questions for you guys. And uh, I was told to sit on the throne over here as I uh, impose my will on all of you. But uh, I want you each to take a minute, and uh, this is a, we kind of did a popcorn. You can grab the mics in front of you guys, and you'll have to share a bit. But just grab, so we'll go ahead and grab those mics. And uh, 
just want to be sure everybody can hear you. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'll just get you know, along. You'll have, you have to do some sharing, but I do want to hear from all of you on uh, on, the, on each question, if at all possible. All right, so here we go. First question: What is your Great Commission burden for the Mid South, or if you prefer the Greater Memphis area? We usually just call it the Mid South. What is your Great Commission burden? And just whoever would like to get us started. If no one jumps in, I'll uh, I can maximum. I can do it. All right. Yeah, I do. I'm with there. <laughs> it's to preach the gospel and then make disciples in our area. Okay. So for for us at Wisdom Savior Ministry, we have been planted in Fraser community. And God's given us a burden to touch that particular community. So you know, while we are open to share the gospel. Anywhere and everywhere, he gives us the opportunity to. There is a special focus on Frazier for us. And there is, in my opinion, such a great opportunity for people who have not met the Jesus of the Bible. People that walk around with their interpretations of who Jesus is and what mom and them said Jesus was, but they don't know Jesus truly. So it's such a great opportunity to share that there's also a great opportunity because people are, are living in levels of, I want to say reduced hope, if not hopelessness. And we can share something with them that kind of builds that hope up in them and gives them something to look forward to. And may begin to look at life a little bit differently and enjoy life and start loving life because it's a gift from the Lord. Mm -hmm. La carga que tiene la iglesia Philadelphia, the burden that uh, our church has. Es de ir y predicar el evangelio a toda criatura según Mateo 28. Is not Matthew 28, 19, 20 to go and preach and, and teach and disciple. Esta es la misión de la iglesia. This is our mission. Sobre la tierra. Eh, nuestra responsabilidad eh, como iglesia planificar de cómo llevar el evangelio. This is a Responsabilidad específicamente o la carga que tiene la iglesia es de llevar el evangelio. We see our responsibility or the burden is to take the gospel a toda criatura to, uh, to everyone a que crean en Jesucristo so that they can believe in Christ como Salvador as their Savior. Y es tarea de toda la iglesia. And that's the, the work of every church. Yeah, go, go ahead. I'll go ahead. Uh, I'm saying again, uh, it's pronounced Bogus, actually. Bogus. Uh, I'll tell you what I want to. Where uh, I help serve a network of uh, churches across the city and homes called No Place Left. And, uh, you know, I was at a, a meeting similar to this last year. Um, it was a NAM church planning meeting. Some of you guys are probably there, but. Um, at that meeting, they shared uh, one statistic that really gripped me and has, has given me a burden that actually has caused me to stay in the, in the U.S. rather than going. My heart has actually been to be a missionary in India. Um, and I lived in India for a year, but recently I decided to stay. Um, there's a lot of, you know, we call them brutal facts and reasons why. Um, I'll share just a few of those, um, but... When I was at that meeting, this name statistic was that there are church planting movements being tracked on every continent on the globe except for North America. It's rapid advancement of the gospel, rapid multiplication of churches and people coming to Christ, and it's being tracked. And but that reality and what God is doing everywhere else in the globe is not happening in North America. 
And that reality shakes me because it, it shows that there's there's something going on and it feels like we're being left out of it. And um, and I know that it's actually not God is the one that's withholding. God's not the one that's withholding from us in the U.S., even though some people might say that. God doesn't, God doesn't do that. He's not the one that's withholding from us. We're the ones that are withholding from him. And so, honestly, one of my major burdens is that we would be able to see a move of God, an acts like movement of God uh, in the U.S., starting from here. We're in the Bible Belt. It's, it actually makes the most sense that it would it would start here. Um, and so we're praying for that. But as far as the Memphis metro area goes, uh, there's the, the most generous estimate um, that, that we've been able to come up with is roughly that there are 400,000 Christians in the Memphis metro area. That's a rough estimate. Um, but what that means is that there's a minimum of 1 million lost. If that's true, that there's 400,000 Christians that means that there is a minimum of 1 million lost souls in our area. And so what we're praying and asking God for our current goal is that we'll be able to see a thousand baptisms in the next few years. A thousand baptisms is a tenth of a percent of a million. A thousand baptisms sounds like a lot, but really at the end of the day, with the backdrop of a million souls, it's a tenth of a percent. It's nothing. Um, it is a lot. You know, but uh, it's nothing, and uh, I'm, I'm actually really happy to share with you guys and celebrate that through through our churches. We've been able to see over 87 people baptized in the past two and a half years, so we're we're, we're actively working towards that and and tracking those people coming to Christ. But that's that's uh, my great commission burden and our collective burden here. Yeah, I think originally. Um, when we planted our church, that statistic of a million people that don't know Jesus really gripped me in this area because you see a church building on every single corner, right? And you think, well, Memphis is reached. You know, the Mid-South is reached. What, what, what are we doing? Why would we plant more churches here? You know, why wouldn't we go somewhere else? Why wouldn't we go to one of the least religious cities in the U.S.? Well, if there's a million people, then there's plenty of opportunity for us to go out and to find these people. And I think, you know, one of my burdens is to find people that no other church is reaching. Uh, I'm not I'm not looking for people that are a part of another church and they're going to come to our church and just kind of hop around and that kind of thing. I want to find the people that don't know Jesus and are not in a Christian community. And so as our church, uh, we've been able, we meet in a YMCA, which we can talk about more later on another question, but uh, we're very non-traditional as far as the, the style of ministry, but we've been able to go out and we've been able to meet people in our community door to door. We've knocked on over 3000 doors in our community uh, in a five mile radius from where our church meets. We've met a lot of people, been able to minister in a lot of ways, share the gospel, invite them into our church family. And uh, we've met a lot of people that are hurting, a lot of people that are without hope, as has been mentioned before, and a lot of people who are in desperate need of a relationship with Jesus. And so there's no doubt they're out there. But my passion and my burden is to go out and to find those people. I guess I'm glad I did follow up. <laughs> uh, I think one of my greatest burdens is this, as you look in this room and see all the men of God wanting it to be this, this standard in all churches. If you look across uh, just the Mid-South, there's so many uh, men not in church. They're not in church. They're not knowing the word. They're not the head of the household. They're not the true provider. So wanting to uh, echo this to have this many men praying, fasting, wanting to see Memphis better in so many different churches. Just, just think about how it would be or how it used to be where you had the men truly being uh, the pillar of the church, crying what it was like it was. Uh, uh, ministry was kind of different, but when you have uh, so many men missing or young men not knowing the way. Look at the way that it falls with our crime, with our, with our violence in, in Memphis. And so wanting to just build 
men ministry, youth ministry, with our ministry. I think this is one of the burdens of passion that I have when I'm working with youth all the time from residential to a uh, mentor. I see how lost they are on um, uh, who Christ is. Uh, they think they could just pray. No, I just pray, ask God to forgive me before I die. It's like, wait, you should have enough time to get that out. And so going into those rigorous areas like you know, going to the apartment complex, going to back into you know street ministry to really bring the the, uh, the message of Christ to everyone again. You know, I know the pandemic set us up to be online, but I think we should pass it. I think we should be in line with Christ and get back out there, uh, evangelize to all people. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, so this one is, uh, and I want you guys to feel free to take a little bit of time. If you go too long, I'll just uh, interrupt you. But, uh, but feel free to take a little time on this one. Because right? I think this is going to be very interesting because I know all of your stories. So here's the question. How did you decide to plan the church? Okay. Eh, hemos venido pastoreando por mucho tiempo. I've been pastoring for a really long time. Y siempre hemos decidido eh, levantar nuevas obras. And I, I just came to the point where I felt like we needed to start something fresh. Lo hemos hecho en Guatemala. Uh, I started in Guatemala. Después de un terremoto. After an uh, er earthquake. Comenzamos a llevar el evangelio. And that's where I began to, to share the gospel. En un suburbio de la ciudad. In uh, one of the suburbs. Y desde ahí comenzó el deseo de the plantar iglesias. And that was where the church planting gene was birthed. Después de pastorear 12 años, la iglesia de Buenas Nuevas, and I, Bautista, there was a, I was pastor there for 12 years, the Good News Baptist Church. Decidimos no ir a una iglesia formal. Uh, we had an opportunity to go to a, a larger church that was more formal. Sino con un grupo de creyentes. But he, he chose to go to work with a, a smaller group of Christians. Uh, decidimos plantar la iglesia Philadelphia. And uh, again, Guatemala. Aquí. Aquí. Okay. Yeah, aquí. And so now he's back in. He's back here in Memphis. And so uh, he left. He left the the formal church to start Philadelphia, where where he's at right now. Llevamos. Un poquito de un año y medio. Well, they've been together a year and a half. Y tenemos una asistencia entre 100 a 110 personas. They're having between 100 and 110. Estamos con el deseo. And we have the, we have the desire. De extendernos. To extend. A otras áreas. Uh, into other areas. Para seguir plantando. And we want to keep planting. La, la iglesias. Churches. Mm -hmm. Viendo la necesidad, we can see a great need. De que también hay muchos hispanos. There's a lot of Hispanics. Religiosos. Who are very religious. No cristianos. But they're not Christians. Y a ellos nos hemos lanzado a invitar, a visitar y hablarles de Cristo. And we do a lot of visitation and we're trying to be in their homes and we share the gospel. Últimamente hemos tenido reuniones en los hogares para alcanzar a otros cristianos, otros no cristianos. We're, we're starting uh, to have groups in homes, so it's more easy for some to go to the homes instead of the church. Después de que hemos sido educados en plantación de iglesias, and as we've learned uh, of church planting, está en nuestro corazón it's in our hearts de alcanzar a los no alcanzados to go further and reach the unreached people groups. Yes, okay. yeah. 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 Well, Jacob said I can take a little bit of time. 
back in 2001, the Lord called me into an evangelistic uh, group called Evangelistic, evangelistic Expeditions. And between 2001, 2007, or 8, we did about, I did about 12 mission trips to Brazil. And it was phenomenal to me to see how someone coming from Memphis could actually impact Brazilians and how we were received by Brazilians and how they loved the message that we were delivering to them. So we did that up until 2007 or so. And then the Lord says that we were trying to plan the next trip. He said, that's enough. No more trips. I want you to do that here. So we started to serve. My wife and I started to serve in the evangelism commission for another church here in the city. We served there for a couple of years. And we sensed the Lord saying, it's time to leave. It's time to do something different. He moved us to a smaller church uh, in the north downtown, north Memphis area. And that's where God called me to be the associate pastor. And I served there for several years. God was training me. He's teaching me. He's still training and teaching me right now. But he was preparing me for something else. But I didn't know when, what, why, how, and all of that kind of thing. So fast forward a little bit. In 2020, we had a transition in the church that I was in, in Frazier. And at that time, one church was closing down. And I was kind of struggling with what it was that the Lord wanted me to do from there. And all of a sudden, one guy, a dear brother of mine, who's, who's serving with me now, came in and said, what is God telling you to do? And that was kind of the confirmation that I had to step forward with that prison safety ministry was started at that point. We started out um, three people, three men, meeting online on Zoom every day at nine o'clock before discipleship training. And I was able to pour into these two other men for well over a year or so. <clears throat> but during that time, God was growing us and changing us. So he gave us the opportunity to start meeting together and if you remember 2020 is when COVID was exactly. going on, but God gave us the opportunity to meet outdoors. We had a, a front yard of a guy who we knew wasn't a member of the church, but he welcomed us to meet in the front yard. So we would go out and set up the, the five gallon buckets and the benches, and we would have church outside. And it was a blessing. So as we got closer to winter, we knew that we had to have an indoor place to go. So we we were again led by the Lord to a gentleman who had a church that needed that wanted some help with his his facility. So we were able to start renting, and we were going there. So the question is, how did I what how what how did I decide to plan a church? Well, I really didn't decide to. This is something that the Lord has been working on for a long time. When the time came. I wasn't in a position to say anything but yes, Lord, to me. And that's how Risen Saving Ministry has, has started. We are still seeking complete direction from the Lord. We don't know what tomorrow is going to hold, what next week is going to hold, but we know as long as we're following His direction, as long as we're keeping Him first, and as long as we're trying to accomplish what He created us to do, then He's going to be with us and He's going to bless us through it. I think it's my turn. <laughs> so, and, and Dr. Bartholomew Ward, he is the pastor of uh, the Brown Missionary Baptist Church in South Haiti, Mississippi. He decided to bring uh, my family and I to Memphis. For us to attend, us, as I'm saying us because uh, my wife Lucy and I to attend Mid America in front of the building. So, my first thought was okay, I'm gonna finish the seminary classes and come back to Brazil. And who knows, someday a church would invite me to be a pastor. But the, God's word says, many are the plans in the hearts of a man, but the will of a God is. 
that that we that is what will be accomplished. Right. So in 2019, we were we both were in a class of a church planning, and we figured out that here in Memphis we had more than two thousand Brazilians, and they were hidden because we couldn't meet anyone here. So in Memphis is very different from other cities in this country. If you go to Atlanta, you have a community. If you go to Florida, as you know, we have the huge community of Brazilians here, but here we don't have. So Brazilians, we, we don't know where they are. And we finished the class and God started to call us to plant the church. And I was struggling with that. And I told the Lord, Lord, we need to come back to Brazil. But planning a church here in the U.S., well, and the professor, he just uh, asked us, well, when you are going to start the church for Brazilians here? And COVID came. We went to Brazil for medical issues. And we were stuck there because uh, President Trump just uh, closed the gates. We went to Mexico. We passed the quarantine. the quarantine over there. And we came to here. And the Lord, he was very clear to our family. And we decided to obey him. And we said, okay, Lord, if you open the doors, we will start the church, and we did it. In 2021, we started the church in our apartment, and Dr. Spread, the president of the center, he just allowed us to use every facilities here because most part of the Brazilians, they I mean, were living in Forzova area. But Dr. Orr, he also, okay, you can use the facilities of uh, our church, and, but the church is in South Haven. So it, it was easy for Brazilians to come here. And since then, we have a, a church, a small church, as you know, every work uh, starts with small groups. And we are uh, meeting here at Mid America three times in a week. That's it. Well, uh, I have uh, a... I was an assistant pastor for a uh, pastor who lost her home. She took to on a mantle of the church. Uh, so just doing youth work uh, again was like my primary. I used to always have men, uh, mentees ask me, uh, how do you know to uh, talk to me on these days? Just certain times I was like, hey, let me talk to you. Kids, certain one was like, Well, how do you know to do this? And I was like, Well, I'm led by God. And it, was, and it was like, If you had a church, I would come. I was like, Okay, God, what you say? Because you know, <laughs> when God tells us to pastor, it's the first thing, like, Are you serious? If anybody in the is like that, like, like I was, like, Are you serious? Uh, this being in church all, all my life, I'm like, that's the headache I don't really want. And for the ones who don't want it, we always end up being. <laughs> and so um, I have identical twin brothers. And so just doing this ministry work with you, um, it always prompted, uh, what are you guys going to do? We work with, I mean, so many youth groups here in uh, Memphis to do so many major things when it came to ministry. And it always came back to that question. When are you going to uh, take on the leadership in which God is giving you? So I was like, I'm just going to keep waiting. And then my pastor came to me and said, hey, this church is filled with youth from the community, from schools that we're ministering at and she said it's their time i said we'll go back and talk to them one more time and see <laughs> is it their time but um i took it all like it's 2020 it's kind of hard to become a church plant right in a pandemic <laughs> <laughs> like god this is what you said 
I panicked in the pandemic. That was one of my messages too. Don't panic in the pandemic. Uh, but actually, the youth they had a desire to still come to the, to the church. It's like, what what we have to do? I was like, well, you know, we go go back to CDC uh, orders. It's like, well, we're here, and through that, they stayed. They grew. Amen. We have like twenty to twenty five teenagers that come each Sunday, and they have drawn their friends. Their uh, parents have came to join the church, and so I was so glad to accept. Uh, you know, the, being chosen by God and the call. And um, with that, and my uh, former lifestyle as a gang leader, it was easy to minister in the streets because I know how they operate. And so being able to minister and go after those souls that I know how they're struggling. And it's just been a phenomenal walk. It's not easy, but like I said, I do have. Uh, identical twin brothers, so if something go too bad, I can always say it, it might have been. I've <laughs> <laughs> been doing this since 2023. So I just love a uh, uh, unique uh, ministry. You know, sometimes God, I don't want to say sometimes, but He gives us what He wants us to give out. And I'm grateful that He's uh, allowed me to uh, minister. It's just so rewarding to hear them talk about the word of God on their own. You know, it's rewarding when they say, hey, can we come up to the church for fast? Can we pray? Can we uh, clean up the church? You know, it's just, just been so rewarding and for them to know the word of God, not for lots of things. That's what I love. So I'm just grateful and thankful for what he's doing. Amen. Um, yeah, for me, it was just a natural progression. I feel like I feel like that's kind of the story that I'm hearing. Is this a natural progression? Just taking steps of obedience to do what we know the Lord's called us to do. It's sort of like for me, I just knew it was I just needed to start sharing the gospel with everybody, you know. And I knew that that's what God had called me to do, and I didn't know how to do it. I just would share about the cross and death with anybody that would listen to me. And that's that was just that was my plan. That was the beginning and the end of it, you know. And um, uh, but what what I began to realize is that I was just sharing with people, but I wasn't making disciples. There's a difference. The Great Commission isn't just about evangelism; it's primarily about disciple making, uh, baptizing them, and teach them to obey. And I was missing that, and so I began to learn and be trained how to make disciples. And when I started making disciples, then the the, the natural progression came again, where uh, I, I began to realize that God's vision and his heart was and his plan since the foundation of the world was to glorify himself through the church. Um, and that's, you know, the, the universal church, but really through local church, local church planting. Like church planting is his plan and his vision. And that wasn't at all on, on my forefront. And then he trained, equipped, and the vision was there through Bible study and recognizing that this is what God's will is. And so then I just began appointing churches, but it, it, a lot of it came out of a, it's, it's a necessity because we began to ask the question, do, do I want to reach my city or do I want to see my city reached? And if the answer is I want to reach my city, I'm never going to reach the city because I'm, I'm not the plan. You know? We're not the plan or one church is not the plan, but we have to multiply, we have to see leaders raised up and we're going to go and plant other churches and so the the question began to change for me and the calling from I, I actually don't want to reach my city I want to see my city reach and that means I have to think beyond myself um, beyond what I'm capable of and what only God's capable of to training and putting people to plant churches because churches plant churches that's the way it's always been that's God's plan from church to church and that's where he's glorified. Most glorified is in his church. And so, yeah, that's why I'm I'm all in on planting churches. That's that's for life. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you know to sum up what I've heard from everybody is um, that we didn't decide, but the Lord decided, right, to plant churches. 
And we simply were called and had the opportunity to be obedient and say yes. And um, so I'm grateful to have been in that same that same vein. And so, uh, yeah, God called me to do it. Um, I grew up here at Bellevue. I've always been uh, in a mega church in all of my life. I've never been. I've always been in the largest church in every city that I've lived in. Um, I don't know any other way to say it until I started this journey. And now I'm a part of a mark micro church. And so, uh, you know, it's just, it's been different. There've been a lot of different challenges, of course, but I think I've learned so much and grown so much and seen that when you are obedient to step out and say yes to the Lord, no matter what, if it's during a pandemic, if it's something that doesn't make sense on paper, if you're doing something else, saying yes to the Lord is always the right thing to do, no matter how hard or how difficult it is. And so that's just, I think, been the the really the core of my journey in church planting. And I'm so grateful for the lessons that I've learned, for the people that I've been able to meet, for the partnerships that uh, have come my way. And so uh, that's kind of just in a nutshell. I, I don't think my situation was anything super special or, or or anything like that. I just think it was saying yes to the call of God. And I would counsel anybody else, no matter if he calls somebody to plan a church or start a business or, you know, step up and be a better dad, you know, to, to say yes to the Lord. So, Amen. Amen, y'all. Hey, I just want to, I just want to say, aren't you glad we have these guys Amen. out here on the front lines of ministry? I mean, we have some very, very, very different churches here. Very, very, very different church planters here. But isn't it fun? And isn't it, isn't it wonderful that you see the same theme through all their stories? And, and, and Josh said it well again. Say yes to God. Do what he says. Do what he says, obey him. All right, next question. What do you understand about church planning now that you wish you had known when you started? You guys can stop. Oh, we're going to start down here now. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'll, just, I'll just give just a second. Uh, okay. I think that what I wish that I understood at the beginning that I do now that I didn't then was how important it is to start your church with a strong group of core team people. Um, yes, if, because if you want to go out and make disciples, you need people that can then make those disciples alongside of you, right? And um, because what I found is this, we are going out into a society where biblical literacy is not high. Even though it's higher here than it may be somewhere else, it's not high. And even the people who know the Bible are not just going to be convinced during a 15 minute conversation whether it's an issue of morality that's played out on the news, whether it's some, uh, some hot topic that's in our culture, um, that is a long process and a long conversation. And so if you are planting a church, it cannot just be up to the pastor or one individual to do this because your impact is going to be very, very limited and ultimately, your tank is going to be on empty very quickly. So the importance is to make sure that from the very beginning, you surround yourself with some type of core team of people that know Jesus, that are mature in him, that show you that they uh, have the fruits of the spirit in their life, that you know what their spiritual gifts are. And so if you have that, you're going to be primed for a lot more sustainability over the long haul. And so that's something that, you know, I thought I had that, Jacob, at the very beginning, and I felt good about it. 
But looking back on it, I wish it was a lot stronger, uh, just being very honest with you. Um, I think one of the things I would uh, say I wish I knew, one, I grew up in church God in Christ. And so with it, um, I never knew all of the trainings. I never knew about uh, like seminaries, so to speak. You know, it's just like, hey, you're a child of evangelist, daddy, a pastor. You're going to be a pastor one day. One day, you know, it's just going to supersede. This is like a fairy tale story. But once I met Jacob and I knew about all of the trainings, he'll tell you, I'm trying to get, like, I did not know all of these trainings that you have access to that is, you're not charged for. You know, like, <laughs> the four fields. Like when I first met him and uh doing this type of work, I was like, how to invent uh evangelize in under a minute. You know, that was <laughs> you never thought that that could happen. And I'm sitting there like, wow, all the uh the resources that you have, uh just like this, pastors being poured into. Uh, uh, just once a month, you don't think to, these things are happening. And I'm like, man, I wish I knew what a sign up in the first class. Like, <laughs> well, God would just put it on my heart. Hey, you're going to be a pastor? Okay, start with the uh, Mid South Baptist, learn about this, you know. Uh, and I think that's something that has been so great the information and the resources that they pour into you to continue to push you on. Uh, just how you met him, he was like, "Hey, you want to?" Uh, he wasn't. We just talked over the phone, and next thing you know, we linked up. It wasn't like, "Hey, you my secretary. We got make this happen." It's just like you really saw true ministry. And, and where I was from, it's like, "Hey, you have to raise the money to make ministry happen." But in the Baptist, it's more, of, "Hey, whatever you're trying to do collectively, we're going to help support you and doing ministry, with you. and you don't see that." Anymore. You know, you don't see it. You don't see where it's like, hey, what are you trying to accomplish? Well, hey, I know this person here. Well, they got a church. That's the name of the Well, open up the buildings. You guys can do this. You can do that. You don't see that often because people are more focused mm -hmm. on their congregation. And I see now that we're focused more on souls. And I love it. So I wish I just known like where I can start and sign up at in the beginning <laughs> when I got the call. <laughs> the first student uh, and to just go and grow into uh, who I am today but I'm grateful that I, I did come across the association and just seeing that wow uh, evangelizing building disciples you don't see or hear that a lot you, you only see about you know let's get out there let's get people into the church for what are we getting you know who are we getting and who they're going to become, why we're going to develop them to be a, a form. You know, a lot of times you're on here, hey, we just need to get the people in. Okay, when the people come in, what are you doing? You know, are you going to uh, eat the fruit and spit out the seed, or are you going to take that seed and sow? And so that's what I've seen a lot of, and I wish I'd known uh, just the development of how church goes. Even while the system has to get ready to transition, I would have started class and very like, hey, we need to be in this. We need to get our the evangelist team into this. We need to get the youth leader into this. Because I mean, since being an association, I get an email like, "Hey, we have this over here for the pastor. We have this for the youth." And I even to send youth out and come back like, "Hey, we learned this. We learned this, and we're able to uh, apply it at our church." So I think that's one of the great assets. But I wish I'd known, like Jacob, like ten years ago, I would be. <laughs> I would be good. Uh, I'll just make mine quick. Um, I, you know, I start churches and homes. So like, our stuff's not all that complicated. It's, it's really not. Um, but it's interesting that even, even though it's not complicated, uh, look, looking back, uh, uh, so I started in 2014. We've seen um, 23 churches started in Memphis and in India and uh, all in homes. And my thinking... Um, now has changed since then is now i'm thinking in terms of minimums and maximums and i wish i had started that way what is the minimum to actually get 
to church and to get to seeing a church started. Um, and a lot of times I found I, I still find myself drifting off into maybe some maximums or things that aren't essential, you know. And uh, and so then I have to constantly try to bring myself back, and I'm still doing this because I want to see more churches started. And if and if we're not staying at the minimums, it just becomes a lot harder to see those churches started and reproduce. And so if, you know, um, yeah, so I just keep it at that. Minimums and maximums. What's the minimum requirement? And the, there's a difference between church identity and church function. They're connected to each other, um, but they are different. And what's, what's the minimum requirement to have church identity and call it a church? Repentant, baptized believers meeting together in the name of Jesus. And then past there, we're growing up into church function and our identity. We begin to use, you know, simple diagnostics for where are we at in terms of health and growth and how do we get where we need to be and, and where we want to be in, in terms of maximums. And um, that's just been so helpful for me. So. Brown, Baptist Brazil, our church is the first church for Brazilians here. If you go through the internet, you will never find any Brazilian church, Baptist Brazilian church. We had today a Christian community, I think. It's a cult, it's not a church. And it is, uh, it is disappearing because people are getting to know the real God and they are coming to the real church. Uh, but we, we, we learned something that's uh, hit us so hard at the very beginning. So when you try to raise leaders, this is a very important thing. You cannot bring people from outside. People that that never work with you or they don't share the same vision you have. So we had some problem, a huge problem at the very beginning of uh, our ministry. We brought a a person to help us in the worship ministry. And we had a problem and we needed to be separated. And you know very well when a church is split, people just leave and that happens. So sometimes we are unwilling to do the will of a God. We think that God has opened the door and answer our prayers. We have been praying for a leader for the ministry, especially the worship leader. But sometimes the, our enemy, he uses that to, to be something else. And we think is an answering of God's prayer, but he is going to, to havoc the ministry or hinder, hinder the work of a man. So we had that problem, but we have learned through Jacob, Ron, Dr. Charpin, people from Mid-South, they are helping us and training us. And we've uh, learned that you need to raise leaders from your own community, from your church, from the members of your church. When you start discipling them and teaching them and training them, you will have the leaders you, you need from for children's ministry, worship leader, and so on. <clears throat> Casi toda mi vida, uh, nearly all of my life. Después de que salí del seminario, after the seminary, uh, me he dedicado. I, I dedicated al pastorado a tiempo completo. I did a full time pastor. Estando en estas condiciones, uh, because of these conditions, uh, hicimos obra por el lado de El Salvador, and we started churches in El Salvador, anduvimos allá por México, por also Mexico, Chiapas, in uh, the Silva de Chapa, también buscando la manera de levantar obra. And we would always look for the way to start churches at the different areas. De ahí el Señor nos trajo 
de Guatemala acá a los Estados Unidos. Me tocó a la madre, eh, Comenzando una obra allí en San Francisco, California. And before we came to Memphis, we started a church in San Francisco. Eh, cuando uno ve eh, la necesidad, when you, when we saw the need, de cómo levantar más obra. They, 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 To, to raise up more new work. Comenzamos a, yo comencé a ver que en el discipulado, I started to see that the discipling era la raíz de todo crecimiento. Was the root of hell, all the growth of toda la iglesia. Of, of every, every, every church. Me di cuenta de que en las predicaciones, I learned that the preaching era poco was a lot of que quedaba en la mente y en el corazón de las personas. The people heard it, but they weren't living it. De un cambio en the a dedicarme in, instead of focusing only on the preaching a discipular and dedicating on the discipling them que ellos tenían que hacer what they had to be doing la obra that they were to do the work. Cuando me trasladé a de San Francisco, California, a Memphis, from San Francisco to, to now Memphis, encontré un problema serio en la iglesia. I found a, a serious problem within the church. No estaban bien fundamentados en la doctrina de la palabra. They, they weren't grounded in, uh, in doctrine, in teaching. E introducimos un instituto bíblico. And at that That, uh, that church we started an institute saliendo aproximadamente entre 18 a 20 graduados and there was 18 to 20 people that turned los, los cuales fueron discipulados and they, they went through the discipling process for unos tres años for three years y que ellos iban a sostener la obra and that they began to uh, lead out in the, in the church ya que íbamos a salir de la iglesia, and then it became the time for us to leave that church. Y mi esposa y yo, and my wife and I, estábamos indecisos. We weren't sure what to do. Donde ir? Where we go? Comenzamos a dedicar una o dos semanas de oración y ayuno. And so we started to pray and fast for a week. Para que nos indicara. So the Lord that would give us. Donde llevar el ministerio. Where are we going to start? El Señor nos llamó. And God called us. En donde estamos ahora. Uh, where we are now. Gracias a la Iglesia Ridgeway. Uh, with the grateful for Ridgeway Baptist. Que abrió las puertas para comenzar una nueva obra hispana. And they opened the door to start a new group of Hispanic church. Comenzamos a trabajar. And we started working. Con muy pocas personas. Very few people. Pero algunos de ellos. One of them habían sido discipulados had gone through um, disciple para expandir el evangelio en el lugar donde nos tiene ahora in, in order to share the gospel to, to make other disciples. Después de haber pasado en las en la escuela de evangelismo acá en Memphis Then there was a school of evangelism, especialmente en la asociación bautista, en la community association, donde tomé herramientas necesarias, and it was from there I got more tools para abrir o comenzar la nueva obra, to, to start the church. Lo que estoy haciendo hoy en día, what I'm doing now, es preparar a otros, is continuing to prepare para que salgan so that they can continue a to nuevas obras so that they can start their own donde no hay presencia de cristianos where, where there are no other Christians. La base fundamental the basics que he tomado for me are y estamos comprometidos the, the commitment y a Dios ha puesto en nuestro corazón and that God puts in your heart que tarde o temprano that sooner or later yo ya no voy a estar con la iglesia I'm not going to be with the church. Tendré que ir a otro campo. I'm going to go to another church. Y como ya están preparados, and so being people prepared, ellos se van a hacer cargo. They will take over. De la iglesia misma. They'll take over of the church. Pero en sí, el centro de 
toda actividad de la iglesia. The central part of all the activity. Radica en el discípulo. Is disciple, making disciples. Es la base. Para the basics. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so can I just say bitch all day everything? Well, look, what did I what do I understand now that I wish I had known before? My previous life before this role that God called me to, I was a member of leadership in FedEx for 28 years. And I was relatively successful in that role, relatively successful in that role. And what I realized throughout that time is I'm not the smartest person in the world. I'm not the sharpest knife in the you know, whatever, whatever say you want to use for me. I understand that there's a lot that I don't know. Like God has prepared me for the role that He's put me in, and He has, I hope and pray, prepared me to the point that I can do what He wants me to do. But what I've learned is there's a lot about the role of a, a pastor, church planner that I didn't know. And that's okay. But what's more scary is learning what I didn't know that I didn't know. If that makes sense to you. So I had to learn. I knew that I had to study. I knew I had to pray. I knew I had to fast. I knew I had to do all of these things to get up and open my mouth and expect the Lord to fill. What I didn't know is I got to be thinking about insurance. I got to be thinking about governmental stuff. I got to be thinking about, you know, we're trying to get a building going. I got to be thinking about engineering plans, and I've got to be thinking about city permits and all of that kind of stuff. I didn't know what I didn't know. And what I wish I had known back then was to find the resources that could help fill those gaps in what God had already put into me. Yeah, and God is blessed me. He is blessed tremendously by bringing some people into my life that can help in some of those areas. But I got to be honest with you, almost every day I figure out something else that I didn't know that I didn't know. So I, my prayer is that God continues to, to bring people into my life and to, he continues to lead people to pour into me so that I can accomplish what he called me to do and not <laughs> let other things fall by the wayside. I heard my brother Josh talk about that tank getting empty. When you start dealing with all the bureaucracy and bureaucratic stuff out here, you can very easily get sidetracked and not put your attention and emphasis where it's supposed to be. So my prayer is that God continues to bring people into my life that can help pour into me, help teach me, and help me to understand how to navigate some of this stuff that's on the outside of our church plan. Isn't it interesting, you guys? All these different church planners, completely different situations. They all basically said the same thing. I need, I need to know more. I need to disciple my people. Isn't that, isn't that, isn't that the, the theme all the way across? Isn't it interesting? All right, guys. Uh, going forward, we're going to be a little more succinct, and I'll just let whoever wants to answer can answer. We don't have to go through every All right, real quickly. What resources have been helpful to you planning a church? I will just let two or three of you answer that. Well, resources that have been helpful to me have been the people in this room and the people associated with the Mid-South Baptist Association, Tennessee Baptist. Those people have answered the questions for me that I didn't know I didn't know. So in addition to that, uh, Psalms, I know I got short time here. Psalms 27 says, Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but I would trust in the name of our God. I'm trusting God, but God is moving through me to accomplish what He wants to have done in really sacred ministry. So I am uh, grateful that God has brought people into our life, into our path that are able. But even more than able, they're willing to help us to be the church plan that God wants us to be. Yeah, I think in a very similar vein, the most valuable resource to us has been partnerships. Partnerships. And I know a lot of churches are represented in this room. Uh, church partnerships to us 
have been the one of the most valuable resources that we have. So in this room, you know, Collierville First Baptist is our local supporting church, and they have provided tons of wisdom and training and teaching and resources and people and prayer and so many different things that is to be honest with you way more valuable to us than raising a bunch of money um because i've seen that we have a partnership with the ymca um, we have our church services inside of a ymca but it's not just on sundays i have an office there we're able to do special programming there. We've reached out to people there. We've seen people come to know Christ. Somebody was asking me this morning, where do you baptize? They have an Olympic-sized pool. And so, you know, just those partnerships. I mean, FCA, other local churches um, uh, have been incredibly valuable to us. So the most valuable resource for us was to say, hey, you know, we need help. Um, and to have a room of people that say we want to help is awesome. And so my encouragement since we're in this room is if you are not linked up with a church plant in some way, shape or form, just know that you could be that incredibly valuable resource to someone else to make a significant gospel impact. It may be in a different area that you're in. It may be with a different people group than you're ministering to, but um, I, I think that's just been our most valuable resource. Uh, I'm just going to jump in here. If you want to know what church players need, they need money and they need space, ranging from someone's house to meet in to another church building to a YMCA or even meeting at the seminary. What they need is a space, a place to meet, and they they can use some money. And then, of course, we we've, we've already uh, talked about training, and so that's what they need. If you want to know what's useful, because uh, I hear it constantly. <laughs> I know all about it. All right, next question. How is your church owning its great commission and responsibility? And once again, I'll just let one or two of you answer that. But, uh, once again, how is your church owning its great commission responsibility? I would say continuing to uh, reach the community in an untapped way. You know, this past uh, weekend, uh, We've done, we did a judgment house uh, and a heaven and hell experience uh, to give young people an insight on the word of God in a different way. Uh, the reason I check my phone so often because I'm a life coach, supervisor, uh, with youth villages, just doing, like I said, mentoring, working with individuals with, who dealt with guns, gang intervention, and the thing that I, I love to see is that that untapped or the unchurched receive the promise. Like it, it is so beautiful to see that, yeah. and so to see uh, it happening at, at this at, at this point, it, it is so uh, beautiful. And I just thank God for the opportunity to do it. But I think that kind of wrapped it up for me too. <laughs> Nosotros uh, asumimos mucha responsabilidad en el campo misionero. We, we have a big heart and a responsibility for missions. Tuvimos la visita de un misionero de España que estamos sosteniendo. We're helping to support a missionary in Spain. Y por decirlo de esa manera, eh, la iglesia lo hace ofrendando the, the church gives uh, offerings for missions en todas las áreas and in every area that they got de sus compromisos uh, that, with their, their commitment y nos involucramos and we're, we're also active en las capacitaciones in the uh, helping the people to become uh, prepared que se nos han dado a través de la misión that uh, how to live the mission Llevamos líderes de la iglesia. We take leaders for the church. Para que ellos aprendan. Say hey, that they learn how to do missions. Y cómo deben de involucrarse. And how they, they can become. Y especialmente preparándose mejor en la palabra de Dios. And especially to get better prepared in using God's word. Siendo una iglesia nueva. Being a new church. Hemos visto 
We've seen que la iglesia está comprometida that the church is committed con misiones, with missions, con evangelios, with evangelism, con llevar el evangelio a otras personas, to take it not just to the other people, no importando de qué raza sea, no, regardless of who, where, who or where they might be. Por eso damos gracias. So we give thanks. Porque se nos da la oportunidad that God's given us now. de seguir aprendiendo that, can, that we can continue to continue to learn tomar las capacitaciones to learn and take uh, initiatives in sharing and yeah. learning. A Dios gracias tenemos en medio de nosotros and we're grateful to have uh, within our group uh, hermano Richard Ricardo y que a veces ha llegado también nuestro hermano Ron yo eh, ha llegado a orientarnos correctamente orientados él se ha dado cuenta del crecimiento de la iglesia en el South en los chales hopes to move in the right direction uh -huh. y todos los que han llegado han llegado con el propósito de incentivarnos o de animarnos es to give us that push Encourages. En cuanto a la responsabilidad, with our responsibilities, como iglesia, as a church, ante el mundo, before the, before the neighborhood, no convertir. That are particularly those that are not Christians. All right. Each of us. Say it. <laughs> One more. Uh, I'll just say that uh, we, every believer in our churches is equipped with a map. They draw a map of all the lost people that they know, and we're very encouraged to pray for them and to set goals for when they're going to sit down and share the gospel with them. Every believer is trained and equipped how to do that um, from the beginning. Even we have brand new believers. Who else do you know that needs to hear about what Jesus has done in your life? You know, and can you uh, share with them? Do you feel confident to to share with them about Jesus? What He's done for them. And we're, we're trying to equip them with that. But past um, just the, the basics of equipping them to share the gospel with their friends and family, as far as Great Commission responsibility goes, um, you know, in Jesus, in the Great Commission, Jesus says it's for all nations um, that he wants to see disciples made, people baptized and taught to obey him among all nations. And so we, we have a list of 18 unreached nations um, that we're trying to see teams formed to plant churches among them. Um, there's a lot of unreached nations in Memphis, actually significant populations of people who, for the most part, have never heard the gospel or don't know anything about Jesus, actually. Um, and so we're, we're um, putting that list in front of people and, and sharing and asking people, is God calling you to, to reach the Vietnamese? You know, is it God calling you to reach the Japanese in Memphis? Um, these nations are here, and that's not Jesus' heart. Um, but we've also, we don't just start churches here in Memphis, so we've actually sent 15 missionaries um, uh, to different cities in the U.S. and overseas to different nations as well. So that's, I think that's surprising for a lot of people to hear that our little churches are sending missionaries like crazy all over the place. Not just that, but we're funding them as well. We're like 80% of our giving. We have giving reports of statistics. 80% uh, of our giving actually goes to missions and funding the Great Commission directly. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, I, uh, I just want to add one thing. Yeah, go ahead. With, with the, uh, I wanted to talk about why, why I mentioned that experience because we had over 250 young people in the house for Halloween. I just want you to think about that. Yeah. And uh, so I, I, I went to it last year. It's pretty, uh, it's, it's and, pretty and awesome. 50 of them want to be, uh, 50 of them got saved, 25 of them want to be uh, baptized within the next couple of Sundays. Excellent, excellent. All right, guys. Well, we are, we are running out of time. I have one bonus question, but you have to be quick, okay? And to be quick, I know it's it's hard to tell a pastor to be quick, but be quick, all right? And we'll just let anyone who wants to all in, again, two or three of the answer. What has been your biggest obstacle in planning a church? It's not knowing everything that I need to know. Anyone else? Igualmente. 
eh, uno no deja de aprender en cuanto a cómo llevar el Evangelio a las, a las zonas que no está presente el Evangelio. The, I would say the same thing is Doug. The same thing is Doug. And it's knowing how to evangelize the hardest groups that you don't know how to get to them. Yo no soy and, you, and you keep learning. You keep learning how. All right, one more. Uh, like I said, I have a, a church based on a lot of you. So being able to get all of them there, you know, the ones who desire to come, uh, no transportation, not having, you know, being able to get them there. And also with funding, we're having a lot of youth who want to keep things going. But it's like, hey, you know, teaching them, you know, tie is different when they don't have jobs. So, you know, that I would say one of the opposite. Awesome, awesome. We'll stop there, guys, just for the, the sake of time. Thanks so much for y'all being up here. Before I dismiss you, I want you each to just say your name again and the name of your church so that these guys want to come and talk to you or look you up online or something. They can do that. So, yeah, just all give us your name and the name of your church real quick. Uh, Brandon Matthews with El Shaddai. How is worship? Josh Allen, Transform Church. Trey Bogus, City Church. No place left. Luis Comi, Baptist, uh, Brown Baptist Review. David Melara, uh, Baptist Church, Philadelphia. Doug Williams with Risen Savior Ministry in Frankfurt. All right, guys. Thanks for being here. Thanks for all your input. Guys, let's give them a round. All right, well, we'll call uh, Leon Jones up here to pray over all of our pastors. He's going to give you instructions about uh, how you can uh, do that. So, Leon, if you come on up. Good morning to everybody. Thank you so much for uh, being here on today. We most certainly enjoy the uh, the dialogue with our planners. Thanks, Uncle Jacob, and everybody in our team for uh, putting this together. We also on our executive director, Dr. Mitch. Uh, and see so many friends that are here. Uh, I was planted by Cottonville First Baptist. And uh, uh, it's a blessing when you can uh, be a part of a church that lets you learn their systems and how to do what you need to do. And so it'll be a blessing if pastors in here can partner with planners. Uh, it's not all about money. You do need money, uh, but you really need to know how uh, and not try to recreate the wheel yourself. Uh, I'm gonna ask Pastor Art to pray for our planners. With our planners, they did some hard work it's the hardest work I ever seen. Uh, planning churches uh, is hard. And uh, those of us that have gone through that, uh, we know. And so, Pastor, I'm going to ask you to pray for our planners, and then I'll move on with my other two items. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful that in your wisdom you have chosen to use people that you have uh, called you've rescued people that you've brought out of the domain of darkness and placed in the kingdom of our lord and savior jesus christ those are the people that lord you are using to help advance your kingdom around the globe. We are grateful and we praise you for that. We praise you for who you are, for all that you're doing. Thank you for these men that we've heard from today. Thank you for those who are, are on the front line of planting churches, Lord God. And we pray for uh, the work that you've called them to, that you will equip them by the power of your precious Holy Spirit, that you will provide for every need 
according to your riches and glory through Christ Jesus, our Lord. We pray that your will might be accomplished in each and every one of their lives, their ministries, their families, Lord God. We pray that uh, you will use all of that to reach and disciple people and to bring glory and honor to your name. We pray for each of them, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Might not know I am the John Lone Pastor of Dwelling Place and I'm on staff as a church plan specialist for Miss South Baptist. But my partnership is with Sin Relief. And so with Sin Relief, uh, it allows me to really try to help planners. Now, uh, you need space to meet for your events or family nights, all that type of stuff. Uh, just call us and let us know, and we can try to get you scared to uh, uh, to use space uh, when you need it. Uh, but as I said, one of the most important things about being a planner is you got to develop partnerships. You, you got you can't do it by yourself. You got to develop partnerships. And so one of the things I was uh, asked to tell you that on the Mid South Baptist website, it's a new link on there. And the link is with the church planners that were in here, the ones that have uh, filled out that information for our uh, website strategies. Uh, you can click on the link and then you can pray for these planners and even connect and partner with the planners. And we ask you as pastors to do that. Now, one big ask, I don't know why they asked me to ask, but I'm going to ask. Uh, you know, we got our marriage retreat coming up. Uh, in February, it's always around Valentine's Day, but it's going to be a little bit after Valentine's Day. And we'll be back at the Hilton Hotel. Now, uh, the cost for uh, a pastor and his wife, uh, did we leave it at 250? We left it at 250. And what we're asking is, is that the pastors in your churches, we want everybody to sponsor a planner and his wife. Now, I've already uh, started off, I, I'm sponsoring Doug and his wife. And so we want everybody to try to sponsor a planter and his wife to the marriage retreat. And so I know all my good friends in here, Ellie Young, everybody, I know y'all um, help us out. Uh, but we want you to give one of the planters and just sponsor them so they can go to the marriage retreat. Uh, $250 is a lot. Uh, uh, when you plan a church, uh, it's a lot. Uh, and so we asked y'all to do that. If, if you do that, I would appreciate it. You let me know. Uh, Jacob, no John, uh, me and one of us, or you can call Shadow and just say, hey, I'm on a plan. And we'll give you a plan to sponsor uh, to the marriage retreat in February. And so if you're going to do it, we need you to go ahead on and do it because we try and get the count right. Uh, and so you can just call the association or uh, uh, send a check to the association and put their planner's name on it. Uh, or you can go on the website and do it. And so we really would appreciate that, uh, my friends, if you would help sponsor. I was one of the ones getting sponsored, and now I do the sponsor. And so it's, uh, it's reciprocal. And so we pray that as we sponsor planners, one day they are sponsored. And I, I learned through church planning to try to plan other churches. Uh, I never knew anything about church planning. I never heard of it uh, besides the biblical rendition of it. Uh, but nobody ever partnered with me to do that uh, until I met Carl your first Baptist. And now I'm planning six churches. And so, uh, so we're praying for our planners that God will connect you with those who will be kind to you and that will be gentle with you and stern or sometimes saying what's mean to me. Hey, <laughs> but, <laughs> still my brother. Still my brother. But, uh, but uh, God bless you today. And so I guess now we're getting ready for a lunch, right, Jacob? So I'm going to pray five months so we can uh, we got to go to the uh, the front and get your little ticket. I think what is it, six dollars? So if you're in here, you can't afford it. Let's let's say I'm no, but I know this is <laughs> but let me know we'll make sure you get us today. All right. Well, God bless you. So the man see the name of the pastor S and his wife to y'all. They from Brazil. 
Um, and uh, I was over there, I think I preached at about four churches in the, there in the United States. And so we'll pray for them and pray and safe travels. They go back tomorrow. Uh, so uh, God bless you and thank you so much. God bless everybody. Dear Lord, thank you for this day and thank you for our gathering and our friends and all of us that was in this work to bring glory to your name. We ask you to bless the food that we will receive for the nourishment of our bodies and your words to our soul. And God, we're so grateful for our association that's just not self-focused, but is community-focused. And we have all types of people that walks of life and races and ethnicities and nationalities. God, we just thank you that we are actually seeing the great commission in person. And Lord, we ask you to bless this month and bless the rest of our day. In your son Jesus' name, we pray. Thank you. Amen. 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 Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm good to see you.